Hey everyone, and welcome to 121 in Flux. I am Peter, that is Connor, and we talk about movies on this show. Randomly select, well, not randomly selected, but so, well, sometimes it's more random. This one's not random, though, because this is like last week's movie. This is, oh, there's a new one coming out. Let's do the original and talk about that because it's timely and because we want to remind ourselves before we go see the new one. So this is going to be about Blade Runner because, of course, Blade Runner 2049 is coming out soon. Um, which is, you know, Joe, this is something I was thinking of, actually, as I was watching it. As you know how sometimes, we've seen this with Star Wars, we've seen it with Alien even, but they go back and do like a prequel to an old sci-fi movie and for mm. some reason all the technology is suddenly very slick, even though it's meant to be set before. Yeah. Here it's actually going to be set 30 years later. So if it's all slick, it's like, well, it's 30 years. That sounds about right. No, no, that, that that's so, fair. So that, that'll, that'll work in that sense. Uh, but yeah, so Blade Runner, science fiction film, Ridley Scott, directed, uh, based somewhat on a story by Philip K. Dick, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? A lot of cuts. We watched the final cut for reference, just in case. Yes. What one of those occasions where you have to actually specify? Yeah, well, I think typically now it's the final cut unless otherwise stated because it's the it's the one to go to. Yeah. Uh, and then even if you watch the director's cut, it's just a couple of little mistakes that are fixed for the most part. There's nothing like you're not getting a vastly different experience. It's when you watch the theatrical cut, you're getting all this different stuff. Yeah, I, uh, I, I can't say I've ever seen that. I've never watched it all the way through, but I've seen clips of the uh, of it with the narration. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll have some stuff to say about the narration when we get into it. But you didn't just, have in this no, version. No, no, we, we don't clear. have in this. But, yeah. but I just, you know, obviously I know there is a version that yeah. exists with heavy narration. So it'll be yeah. interesting just to, to mention it. That's 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 fine. Uh, I guess we'll do a little bit of spoiler free. Uh, not necessarily because I feel like it's something we need to do, but just because I feel like we can talk about a few things that aren't spoilery, and then I'll give you a warning before we get any spoilers. Mm. So, what is Blade Runner if you're somehow uh, in the dark? Blade Runner is a science fiction film set in 2019, which now feels like, you know, well, it's two years away, exactly. So, it, 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 yeah. it feels around the corner. It feels like, oh, we're already at that, more or less. It's, it's, it's almost a shame the new one's this year, and not in two years' time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do kind of like how a lot of science fiction movies that were set in the future a long time ago, but we've gotten to the point now where we're, you know, Back to the Future 2, we've, you know, we hit that date, you know, uh, same again. Even in this movie, it mentions the birthdays of some of the, the replicants are 2016 and 2017, and it's like, mm. oh, that's weird. They're, they're just we're, we're at that now. Uh, it's kind of funny how they've stopped being just the future, and they've kind of turned into alternate realities because we just have to kind of do that in our heads to explain, okay, it's not our world now. It can't be. Yeah. Yeah, it can't we're, be, you're right. We're too uh, close. And I mean that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, that's not a big deal. They couldn't have got it right. Uh that said, this movie got a lot of things right. I mean sure there's no flying cars, but there's a lot of other things that... Oh no, there there is some other stuff that is dead on, yeah. Yeah. Um so you know, I mean in fact parts of uh like Shanghai, for example, apparently if you if you're there at night it looks like the city. You know, take away mm. the flying cars, the the idea of all the lights um, and the billboards. Yeah, you know, from video. from you know, just general knowledge yeah. of I, I can see it. Yeah, so, like, you know, there's already parts of the world that kind of look like this. Uh, it's just the replicants and the flying cars. Once you take out those, it's like, oh, we actually are kind of there in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that and we're not moving to off-world colonies. And most animals aren't mostly extinct. Yeah, true. If anything, that was actually... Everything else was a bit optimistic versus real life, but that was actually more pessimistic. No, no, we still have some animals. We're, we're good. Yeah. We still yeah, have some. We've got a few. Uh, so, so yeah, so the whole premise of the movie, of course, is that it's a world where replicants exist. And what is a replicant? It's basically an android, but it's more biological. Like they're, They kind of have blood, they have skin, all the rest of it. They're kind of fake people. And they're built as slaves. They're built for slave labour. And they do stuff off-world on uh, other planets where they sort of terraform and that kind of thing. There's a, there's a you know paragraph at the start of the movie that kind of explains this and sets the scene. And so they do that. They're basically slaves. But after uh, some attacks, some of them revolted, they became illegal on Earth. And the Blade Runner is a type of policeman who hunts them down because they're illegal, so they get assassinated on sight. That's the role. Uh, which makes sense to a point because they're not considered people, so why would there be anything other than just right, it, it take even them out? tells you that in in the opening text yeah. where it says, you know, this isn't referred to as execution; it's called retirement. Yeah, because it's turning off a toaster is the the thinking. Yeah, uh, you know, it's pulling the plug out and just ripping the plug out so it can't turn back on. That's all it is. 
so why, why would you feel? But obviously, as with any science fiction movie about androids or cyborgs, uh, it's kind of about. But do they have humanity? Like, is the, is yeah. this inhumane? It's a, or what's going it's, on? it's a it's a classic staple of of the the genre, really, isn't it? Yeah. So so that's that's very much what's about. Harrison Ford plays the main Blade Runner, uh, Deckard. And he's kind of reluctant, he doesn't really, you know, he doesn't like life, doesn't like his job, he wants to get out, he's sort of dragged back into it, because this group of four replicants um, are on the loose. Uh, they've escaped back onto Earth from an off-world colony, they've murdered people to get there, and their mission is because, one of, one of the other big details that's brought up is that because they basically expected that after a few years they would start to, like, get their own feelings and become self-aware, and not just, like, do what they're told, they built in a safety device which was basically that they would only have a four year lifespan they've got like a, a time there's like a countdown to their death from the moment yeah. they're created uh, and that's to combat the idea that eventually when they do start to become self-aware and have their own feelings it'll just shut them down and you know um so they're on earth trying to prevent this they're aware of it and they want to solve they that wanna, problem. they want to turn that off basically yeah so so that's what they're doing. and it, that's kind of one of the things that i like about the movie is that their motive is actually it's not villainous. Like, I mean, it's not to say... No, they it's self-preservation. They, they do That's villainous all. stuff in the movie, don't get me wrong, but their actual core motivation is actually very hu- humane, and you kind of res- respect why they want that. It makes sense. Yeah. So, it, you know, uh, I like that. It's, it's not just uh, black and white. There's definitely lots of shades of grey going on uh, in here. So you've got that. You've got this uh, futuristic city, flying cars, neon lights. You've got the, the, the score... Uh, yes. From Vangelis, uh, beautiful stuff. Oh, absolutely! Which of course was used in the, the trailers for the new one and all that. Uh, although I think it's a new recording, but either way, it's, uh, it's, it's great. I don't stuff. know if I've actually seen a trailer for the new one. You haven't? Oh, interesting. Which it, it, I, I know it's strange. I, I've, I've seen like, at least not with sound. I've seen you know, you know when you scroll on Facebook and they start playing, mm. and I've watched like five seconds and gone, okay, cool. And like, obviously, obviously, I've seen all the the, the very colourful posters. Yeah, but yeah. I've not actually sat down and watched a full trailer. Fair enough. I mean, you know, it's not that long now till you get to see the movie. So yeah, it's close enough now. That I'm going. Why bother? Um, it's weird that you've not got one in the theater, though. I know it's really strange because I've had a few. Th- I've had both trailers like once or twice each. Yeah, I've, I've gone. It's not like I've not been going. I've been going. I've been expecting to see it at some mm. point because, like I said, I haven't like actively gone looking for it. But if it comes on, yeah, sure, I'll watch it. But yeah. no. So music's very good. Um it's a, one of one of the highlights watching it on the Blu ray, the, the Dolby True H D soundtrack. Uh sounds mm. glorious. It's because I feel like a lot of the older movies that they do a five point one mix of for the new like discs and stuff so that they feel up to date. Typically it's kind of a half assed job where it's just a stereo track with a few things thrown at the back and you know yeah. the subs almost never used. You can kind of feel that there's not been that much effort. Uh, right from the get go with this, it feels like no, they did an entirely new mix. So someone sat down and did this as a proper, you know, as if it was a new movie. They just sat down, took all the elements, and yeah. did it from scratch. That's what it feels like, and uh, you, you can really feel the difference. There's, you know, there's only a, a cu- I'd only say there's a couple of dozen movies, like old movies that have got that treatment. They all, they all get the visual remasters, but when it comes to the audio, it's like, oh no, we'll, we'll throw a few things onto the surrounds, but you know, we don't really. They mostly don't care. They're just like, ah, audio's there, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, which was just fine. Like, you know, if I'm watching, if it was originally created in stereo, as long as that stereo track sounds good, I have no problem. But uh, yeah, exactly. When they go above and beyond like this and it actually utilizes the surround sound and you actually hear the ships flying past you and all that you, sort you, of stuff. You kind of feel like, look, if you're going to do it, do it. If not, just leave it in stereo. That's fine, but don't pretend you've done something so you can say look yeah. there's a new 5.1 mix yeah you know you put, put it in lossless you know give me the lossless version of course because uh, that's what criterion do like, they'll, they'll, they'll leave the movies that are in mono in mono but they'll give you it to it as a as a lossless track so it's you know high quality that's uh, way to do it i think uh, yeah and it'd be weird to, i think it'd be weird if they did like a 5.1 new version of like say i don't know uh, some some old foreign movie that's all talking like yeah. almost what's the point almost right it, it, it's kind of just look if that's how it was leave it but just up the quality as much as you can and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know do it in the the present the best way that it can be presented as it was intended hmm. so yeah music's very good which is kind of the point and even just the sound design in general is very very good mm. uh, you know there's, there's a lot of like uh, derelict buildings with dripping water 
like a lot of the movie, and you can just you feel like you're there because of the sound. And the visual, I mean, the visuals are glorious. The, the the way Ridley Scott's playing with light and like light shafts and all that sort of thing inside and then outside, all the rain and the 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 the, the, the neon lights, the, the big video billboards and all that sort of stuff. Visually, the, the movie's breathtaking from pretty much start to finish. I don't think you can fault the visuals. No, not at all, really. No, visuals and audio, you cannot fault. Um, now we've both seen this before, which is why I've not done my usual. Connor, do you like Blade Runner? Because I usually do that. I usually that's kind of how we start the conversation normally. Mm. I'll give you a brief synopsis of what the movie is typically about, and then I'll say, "What do you think of it?" But I already know that Connor likes this but doesn't love it. Um, so I'll ask instead: How do you feel any differently after this viewing? I definitely don't like it anymore. Which, right. like, like I, I went into this. Uh, when I first watched this, I was like, okay, I can see how maybe this would be better on a second viewing. Mm. But instead, I feel the same, maybe slightly slightly worse because the mystery isn't there this time. You know, I'm not uncovering it as I go. Yeah, I can I can see that. But um, it's, it's in a similar region, I think, for me. What, funnily enough, what I've realized after this viewing, right, is this wasn't the best viewing I've had of it. And that sounds like a really negative statement. And I guess it kind of is, but... What I really mean is it's not so much that I like it any less than I did before, because I, I, I quite like Blade Runner, um, and I think Blade Runner is a weird movie where almost everyone I know who likes it didn't like it that much the first time, because I don't think anyone expects what it is when they first watch it. Like They, they, they go into it thinking it's more of an action movie, maybe, they don't expect the, the slow pacing and a few of the other things, you know, they, they expect so, something else. And most people come out going, oh, it looked pretty, but I didn't really feel it. And then they watch it again, and they maybe get a bit more of the nuance, and they get a bit more of what's going on, and it grows on them over time. It certainly did for me, because I, I didn't love mm. it the first time either. And, you know, I still I think, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I outright love it now either. I, I think I like it a lot, but... I think I was expecting that. Like, okay, I'm going in, I know what I'm getting. And mm. obviously, you know, we've covered a bunch of slow-paced movies on here already. It's clearly that's not a, a problem for me. Oh, no, sl- slow-pacing... Uh, it can be great, but there's definitely some troubled areas in this where the pacing is an issue, and I'll, I'll we'll get into those. Yeah, and I think ultimately at the end of it, I'm like, okay, I get what it's doing, I, I understand it, but there's I still have a bit of a disconnect where I can't quite get into it. So, like I was saying, what I've realised after this viewing, because this, this is like a sort of a weirder viewing in that, well, not weird, but I didn't watch it today because I was in the mood to watch it. I watched it today because we were doing this video. So I put it on and watched it for that reason. And kind of what it made me realise is that I really have to be in the mood for Blade Runner when I put it on. Because during the the, 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 the slower stretches uh, and during the sections that I don't like as much, I was really not liking them. Like I was really, you know, the phone was out. I was kind of like zoning out and not really... I, I, I'm of the mindset where it's like, I, I like this movie, but if there's not a reason to watch it, I don't know if I'd watch it again. Hmm. Like, 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 does that make sense? No, I, I, I get you. It, it, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's funny because it's. I don't think I've ever encountered a movie that's at this level of prestige that Blade Runner is, that has such a weird mixed fan base of like people. Some people do love it, but there's so many people who do have a lot of problems with it and then there's some people who just think it's completely boring and want nothing to do with it and like everything in between it's so and that, obviously like, every movie has their you know their, their, their yeah. tractors like that's a that's a common thing but with this one especially like so many people who like classic films and like movies of this kind don't like this one it's, it's one of these weird cult movies where it really did split people down the middle and mm. and even even as much over time as it's went on as well. That's the thing with with cult movies. They typically they they're discovered by a certain fan base, and then most of that fan base will love it. Yeah. And then, but but here, even people who this should be like, like like judging by our tastes in general, we should love this film. But yeah. clearly, we we don't quite. Yeah, that, that, I think that's fair. I like I like it a lot, um, hmm. but I. I I do think there is some serious issues with it. Uh, in terms of pacing and in terms of a couple of the characters, uh, a little bit of a refocus to other things at certain points would have would have yeah. done a world of difference, I think. 
Um, because honestly, there's, there's some details that I remember not catching the first time, and not not like complicated details, just like how he found someone, for example, at the first viewing. I don't think I caught because it was just such a. a it small, kind of brushes over it, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it brushes over a lot of things, and it's it, it's it's kind of does this weird thing, it's especially when he when he's tracking down one of the replicants. He's tracking down a what's her name, Zora, the Snake Lady. Uh, like he gets to her through a photograph. Which, by the way, he he does that bullshit uh, CSI Enhance, thing. Yeah. Right? Now I'll give them a little bit of leeway with this in this case because it is a science fiction film. It's the maybe the future, you know, new technology. Maybe, maybe they can do yet. it then. Yeah. yeah. So so you can kind of, but he, he really like he ends up finding a reflection in something, and it's you know it's the, the grade A bullshit. Yeah. But so he does that, and him him like telling the computer to enhance about fifty times is boring as hell. Like that scene is dull. It as goes shit. on for so long. It, it is. And then, you know, he goes to someone else. He's like, oh, have you seen this lady? What's this? Like, he got a flake of material. Oh, what's this? Oh, this isn't that. It's snakes. Which, by the way, because then he goes, snakes? And I was like, why did it have to be snakes? Like, you know, I yelled that out as he said it, because it's Harrison Ford. And of course it did. Right? And then that leads him to this other guy who sells fake snakes. And he's like, oh, yeah. And it's, it's this chain. And it's like, somehow this has been really detailed with how he gets there. But at the same time, I feel really brushed over and uninterested in all the actual parts of it. Yeah, it's, it's strange because it, it has this, you know, it's aiming for this neo-noir sort of thing with the, the detective stuff. But it doesn't actually put any weight into the detectiving. Mm. No, like, it's like, okay, here's the motions, here's all the steps that he's got to go through. But we don't actually care about the details. We just want to get to where we're going. But we, we're committed to showing it. Yeah, and... It, the sad part is, though, is that all the themes that it's playing with and the characters themselves are mostly pretty interesting. Because ultimately mm. what the movie's about is uh, Deckard kind of rekindling his humanity because he kind of learns that these replicants do have humanity in them and they are more than just toasters. That's kind of what the, the movie is. And when it's playing with those ideas and it's when it's, it's given as the villain, it's given as Roy Batty, uh, you know, Rutger Hoyer's character, when it's given as him and he's doing his thing, he's probably, I mean, he's probably the standout character in the movie. Oh, yeah. But when it's given as him, and it's like these these sort of debates about life, and when it's actually hitting those core themes, it's very interesting. But when it stops to do the detective stuff, it becomes the slow crawl of. And and this is where I feel like to go back to the narration, mm. where I, I've never actually seen it with narration, but mm. I feel like with the right narration it could be improved because again that would hit on those noir feelings you know that was a, a staple of that genre and it maybe would give it something so where instead of just showing us these things we can get inside some thought processes while it's happening yeah the narration didn't do that the, the narration... no no that's what i'm saying as, as i say it could be great do you, do you know what the narration actually did though i do not it just described what was happening on screen it was redundant yeah. information because right uh, yeah that, uh, see at that part I see why you remove it but if you wrote the yeah. narration properly you could get that evoke that tone of the noirs and then provide something more than what's just happening with the detective work I don't want narration I actually uh, and maybe it's because there's a stigma with this movie because the narration they did get was yeah. really bad um, but I certainly don't want it um, I, I think. I think it's just time focused on the wrong things. I don't think you fix what's what, the problems I have with this. I don't think you can fix with narration. No, that's fair. Uh, I, I think the problems I have because I have the problems with the detective stuff. The detective stuff is really, really boring, really, really dull. Uh, I, like I, I don't care what's in this photograph, and I don't, I don't care. Like I don't care about the steps. Um, and another thing that kind of falls flat for me, and I don't know if this is controversial uh, for Blade Runner fans for me to say this. But the romance with uh with what's her face uh, mm. Rachel, yeah no, I... not not really feeling it. And I like parts of it. I like that he kind of like he's the first per he's the first replicant he sees that he sees more than just a machine because he sees that she's upset about finding out she's a replicant and that you know I like that moment. I like what comes of that. But the actual romance part. No, no, I I agree with you. Yeah. I like the ideas and and what it means because like you say it's this idea of wait, hang on, if she can be more human than me, essentially, and it's kind of this, it's the start of his realisation into rediscovering his humanity. But the actual romance doesn't really do anything worthwhile. Because, and I feel like you could devote more time to that, um, especially since the detective work, 
there's a lot of detective work building up to uh, Zora, but the other characters later on, he just gets a call about something else that happens, and they have an address for him based on someone who was there. And you know that's good. and that's set up in the other part of the movie with the villains, and he just goes to the location, and that's it done. There's no detective work for the rest of the movie. And and it's like okay, fine. If we were just going to jump ahead like that anyway, why did we? bother with all the detective yeah, work we, we, we could have done that in the first place i mean if you just cut it out and made it simpler so that it, it sort of went straight to her that would have at least solved some pacing because it would have been like been gone but uh, uh like in its defense maybe they would have felt like it was a bit cheap then to just rush straight to it it may have done uh but it's the kind of thing where now that i know what it's like doing it this way i'd, I'd almost be yeah the, yeah the that's cheap. it you, there's no way of knowing which one would ultimately have been better um, but at the end of the day this one did not work for us. Yeah. Uh, but I think instead of just cutting out a time, we'll use that time a little bit more to develop that relationship and develop why maybe we do care about uh, his feelings for her beyond just what it adds to the themes of humanity. Yeah. Uh, the actual romance part of, of them finding each other doesn't really do a whole lot for me. Uh, the, the, the other most boring scene in the entire film is probably the, their lo- love scene. Like when it you know builds up to them finally kissing and yeah. doing that stuff. That That is really really dull that scene it's it's incredible that some of this is amazingly well shot mm. but then you have sequences like that the love scene the detective work that's just really just boring it just sits there and watches him do something that but it doesn't do anything interesting mm. so yeah i'll give the spoiler warning just now just because i feel like we're starting to talk about uh things yeah. in the movie a little bit further up so uh i'll just you know give the spoiler warning full spoilers from this point on so yeah, so so those are my my main criticisms with it, and it does take up a good chunk of the runtime. Uh, yeah. However, uh, the other stuff that is great though, we mentioned the visuals, we mentioned the audio, is pretty much a feast for those two things almost the entire time. There's a couple of times where it dips during the detective work, but most of the time it's it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the core ideas with uh, them hunting down their maker because they want to be fixed. You know, they're hunting down Tyrell, who's the head of the Tyrell Corporation who made them. And they go to the guy who makes the eyes and, and it's all like, you know, uh, everything's looking really cold because the, the, the conditions have to be freezing. Mm-hmm. And he's wearing this big suit with the uh, pipes coming out the back of it, which is pretty cool. Uh, and they go to him and that leads them to uh, who I'm going to refer to as the Toy Man, but uh, J.F. Sebastian. Because uh, he can get him inside. Because you know you can't just go up and get a meeting. It's like going up. It's it's like some random are going up to the White House and say I want to meet the president. Like, you, yeah. you you can't just not, go not, in. Not going to happen. Yeah. But no, this guy can get them in. And Press, who's one of the replicants, kind of maybe seduces isn't quite the right word, but certainly gains his trust and sort of flirts a little bit and makes him feel loved because he's a lonely guy mm. uh, to gain his trust and that gets 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 them inside and. That, that could, and you know, I love the scene with him and Tyrell. It's it's a really strong scene of him like asking why can't this be fixed, and it gives him a lot of reasons why like, it just can't be. Like the way it was done, it's not irreversible. Yeah. Um. And you know, it's like oh, this mor- 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 mortality. And you know, and he brings up some interesting points. He's like, oh, you know, uh, you you, you know, a life that burns uh, twice as bright is half as long. Like he brings that point up, and you have done so many things. Like you know, we hear all these stories of uh all these implications of just how much of a sort of act of few years it's been for Roy and how good he yeah. is at his job. Because he, he was designed to be, you know, a, a combatant. He was designed to be smart. And he's done all these things. Um, and of course, I mean, the best scene in the movie is, is the is the ending. Or, you know, the, the oh, final yeah. fight, the, the, the rain, the rooftop speech. Of course, that's the, the infamous moment, isn't it? Yeah. You know, when, when he saves Deckard. Uh, and, you know, because the, the whole sequence is great because it's... Basically, Decker's screwed. He shoots Press, she's down, and it becomes almost this horror movie of Roy stalking him through this like abandoned building, and there's like you know rain yeah. dripping everywhere. He's taking his shirt off, so he's running about tops. He's, he's almost like a cat, the way he's sort of prancing around, and he's so quick, so cunning. Yeah, it's this incredible chase sequence. Yeah, it's every part of it's beautiful, and it ends up in the roof of the rain, and, it, and, it, and instead of letting Deckard fall, he saves him, um, because he recognises something. I mean, he recognises humanity in him. Yeah. Um, and he, he gives his speech, and you know Deckard kind of has his final final moments of like realization as this happens, and uh, it's definitely the most beautiful moment in the film, and it's definitely where the humanity of the film comes from. Mm. It's just it's a shame that some of the other characters don't get the same treatment and love. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. 
Um, Rachel especially, uh, she's there for a plot reason, and then once that happens, she's kind of like... It, al- it almost implies that after they have sex, she's just lying in his bed until he gets back at the end. Right, it kind of just forgets about it for the rest of the film. Yeah. Um, it's it, it's oddly dismissive of a lot of the things that it starts with. Yeah, it's this weird thing where it's, it's so focused on Deckard that everything is only relevant as it's relevant to him. I'd say Deckard and, and Roy. Uh, and Roy, yeah. It, it cuts to Roy doing it cuts, things. Cuts, yeah, yeah. But it's only things that are relevant to them we see but as soon as they're not relevant they're kind of forgotten about yeah you know, like, like it's kind of okay he's had sex now it's done you know he, he can get on with with it with the rest of his job and he can think about other things but uh, it, it, it is a very it's, it's a very frustrating movie in that sense because i feel like with a few things with a few changes it could be one of the best science fiction films ever made and as it is it's one of the best looking and sounding science fiction films ever made uh, with some really good standout moments which, but unfortunately, there's there's a real lack of drive in the film for me. Uh, you know, like, yeah. once it gets going, it's like, okay, you know what his job is? He's, he's trying to find these people. But there's never really much in the way of personal stakes for him to find them. No, because the whole thing, he's kind of resigned. He doesn't want to be doing this job anymore, and he's kind of forced back into it. And he's kind of just doing it because he has to. Yeah, the one bit of conflict that comes in is when is when Rachel kind of like runs away from the company, she becomes also an illegal replicant and she's like added to the list. You need to take her out as well. Uh, so that adds a bit of conflict and that's a fine idea. But that's quite late in the movie by the time that that's relevant. It is quite late in the movie, but it also doesn't affect why he needs to catch the others. No. like The, the whole thing is, oh, we need you to do it because you're the best at it. And mm. it's like, okay, that's fine. I believe that because it's Harrison Ford. But yeah. Why should he go, oh, all right, then, I'll do it. But by the time we get to, you know, because when he actually goes off, he gets the call, because it's, it's, after, it's after Roy has killed Tyrell. He squeezed, his, he squeezed his head in, crushed it with his bare hands. and Looked pretty good. Apparently killed Sebastian as well, which is a real shame, because Sebastian felt like a really nice person. Yeah, uh, he was just trying to help. If anything, he's one of the most likable characters in the entire movie, because he, he seems like this genuine kind of guy. He just, you know, he's, he, you know, he's not allowed to go off world. That's why he's still in this shithole that's Earth. Because um, yeah. he he's, he ages too fast, which oddly oddly makes him relatable to the replicants because it's a similar thing almost. Right, where he's going to die younger than he should. It's, it's why I think he understands them and kind of goes, "All right, yeah, like it's easy for him to to be seduced and go along with it because he does understand what it's like to have this this cursed life almost." Oh, partly, but I, I think uh, also they set up the idea that all, not only does he help make them. He he refers to the other creations that the toys he makes as his friends. So he's already got this weird connection with the things right. he builds. He's already right, got right. that. But, but specifically, like, like he's predisposed to it because, like I say, he he has this shorter life than than he should have, and he's confined. He's trapped on this world. They're they're trapped away from Earth, but he's trapped on Earth, and it's yeah, you know, mm. it's this, this the same problems that he's facing that they are. So I guess we have to talk about the the elephant in the room. Or should I say, the unicorn in the room? Because that, this is very notorious amongst Blade Runner fans. It's, it's again, it's a very div- uh, divisive thing in in the film. Uh, the original theatrical cut did not have the the dream sequence of the unicorn. Ah, okay. So the the original film didn't really have the implication that the director's cut and then the the final cut had, which is that because. We set up in the film that, you know, Deckard says to Rachel all these, like, memories that she has and these things she dreams about because he could get that information because she's, she's fake. She's made up. She's all those based things. on someone else. Yeah, all those things were, were put in her. And at the end of the film, uh, what's his name? Gaff, played by Edward James Olmos, who's like the, sort of, the, the cop who's kind of forcing him to do everything. He's the one that comes and picks him up repeatedly. Yeah. He, he's into origami, and he's been doing that throughout the movie. At the end of the film... Uh, he leaves and uh, or Deckard's leaving with Rachel and there's an origami unicorn outside of his door and it's almost like a message and Deckard kind of like nods knowingly to, as to what it means and that's kind of where the film ends and the implication there is pretty heavily implying that Deckard himself is a replicant yes. and the fan base uh, is very split on this I think where some of them are adamant that this is a terrible idea some of them are adamant that it makes the film better and the funny thing is though is in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to know for sure because yeah, I mean, it's one of those, there's there's a few other things that that you know hint either way. Like you know, I think it's when uh, 
she asks him, has he ever taken the test? You know, that, the test that proves mm. whether or not they're a replicant. And he doesn't answer. And it's kind of like this idea that, 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 that he, you know, it's there's, there's, there's kind of the implications that's a no. And it's like, okay, but if he hasn't taken it, maybe he could be one. It's there a few times. I actually like the idea. Uh, I, I like the idea that they actually build replicants to hunt other replicants. There's, there's some sort of, like... Like perverse, because I mean, obviously, even even Roy himself, you know, talks about them being slaves. He's like, oh, like this is the fear of a slave, like the way you're always scared about what's going to happen mm. to you. That's what he says to him. Uh, it's mentioned a few times in the film, and I think there is a very kind of slave-like mentality to that, where you have one control another one, like you have one hunting the others. Uh, yeah. But in this case, he doesn't know, and I also I just I like that idea that he sort of realizes who he is, and it, it's just it maybe acts an extra bit of. Uh, depth to the idea that he discovers humanity through another right. one. This is it where I don't mind either way. Like I don't love. Like, I don't have a strong opinion. Well, I, on I've got. I've got, side. I've got an argument for the other way though as well. Yeah. The argument for Go the on. other way is though is that, but does it not make it more affecting if he rediscovers his own humanity if he is a human from a replicant? Like it's a right, replicant it, who to because he, he's so like done with life and. Um, but my big problem is though is that either way I don't think the film actually explores the idea well enough because if he is a replicant I feel like it's actually two small things that kind of imply it and they don't really go into this idea of like not knowing what he is as well and if it's the other thing I do kind of feel like the movie doesn't really give us enough to really tell us about him and give us the arc as much as it should. It, it feels oddly underdeveloped, it would be yeah, my case. It's, it's one of these things where, like you say, if he is human, then it's the idea that, okay, he, he rediscovers what it means to be alive and what it mm. is to be human. And he, he learns this from this machine. Like saying, it's like, okay, if they can do it, why can't I? Yeah. And then if he, if he is, uh, and, and of course, then you have like, the, it's, it's literally like man versus machine showdown. Whereas if he is a machine, it's the idea where, if he can become human, he is this human that he doesn't even realize he has overcome what he was supposed to be, essentially, and he became better than what he could have been. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that if, if he found if he if he gets this humanity at the end, if he was a, a replicant, he was never supposed to have that. He was never supposed to really be human. So it's the idea that he, he became better than what he was built to be. So I like both messages. Yeah, because yeah, if if he is a replicant and he's a replicant designed to hunt others, like this way he feels is meant to be how he's always meant to feel. Well, this is kind of what he's programmed to be. So yeah. if he overcomes that, yeah, he's kind of achieved more than he was supposed to. So he's he's realised that as well. Um, some people hate the idea he's a replicant and they think it ruins the point of the film because to them it is about him discovering his humanity through yeah, it, through I, a machine. I know Harrison Ford famously hates that, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, Ridley Scott, on the other hand, is adamantly for the replicant theory. In fact, if I recall correctly, in one of the interviews on one of the many extras on the the big Blu-ray set, um, he says it's clearly there in black and white. If you don't see it, you're an idiot. Yeah, because I know that there's that famous story where before they started shooting, that you know, you know, it was all filled, like scripted and everything, and and Ford and Scott were having this conversation. They were and they were like, no, we'll we'll leave it ambiguous intentionally it'll be it'll always be a maybe but it's a but but to to ford he was like to me it's a no and like because it was enough there that you could read it either way and then over the years really scott's kind of changed it's like no no it's it's pretty definitive now yeah. and obviously with the new one coming i'm just assuming with because of obviously his involvement as a producer is like, okay yeah it's probably going to go that route isn't it but then maybe not i mean the, the trailers for the new movie has a lot of harrison ford but i'm not seeing any rachel so no no it's fair I, I mean i can they go this whole movie without addressing it would that uh, be weird i don't know maybe they could maybe they could leave it ambiguous still i, I could see them try to pull that off actually uh I, I could see that that happening i yeah i don't know i'm like I, I can live with it either way i think both are interesting for different reasons yeah but i i do I, think that I, I think that neither one is explored as much as it should be though I agreed. I think we're probably in the minority, not actually caring which way, because we like both potentials. Yeah, I think there's, there's there's potential in both, but I don't think the film actually, like I say, it feels undercooked in that by, sense. By the time it hints at it, it's kind of it's right at the end. It's like oh, it's it's almost like a last minute twist swerve, but it never delivers on it to to go why that should be a swerve. I feel like 
you know, I think Ridley Scott's a very visual director, and that's clearly, you know, where this film's strength is. And mm. I think the script just wasn't at the point where they'd really decided what the movie was about. And yeah. as a result, it's like kind of all these undercooked elements. It's the undercooked detective elements. It's the undercooked, you know, man, like machine humanity elements. It's the undercooked yeah. love story. It's all these things feel undercooked where none of them are really... Uh, the man vs. machine thing and like, the humanity is definitely the best part, but the rest of it definitely feels really underwhelming because it, none yeah. of it really commits to any of it. Right. I, like, I remember hearing that the, the original you know, first cut of this was like four hours and... I feel then that they were probably more explored and, and more defined, all of them. But instead of when they cut it down to, you know, a more manageable length, they didn't go, OK, well, let's cut out this idea and work with this theme. They kind of went, well, we'll just cut down all of them. Maybe. I, I don't know. It's, it's, like, it's, never, yeah. it's hard to say without actually seeing the four hour cut. <laughs> and, it is. And seeing yeah. what was cut out. Because for all we know, it, it was just four hours of this. And Yeah, maybe there was another three subplots that we just don't know about. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Um, so no, nah, so that's that's kind of kind of it. Um, for for the record, by the way, are you aware of how the theatrical cut ends? Uh, no, I've never never. Looked. The theatrical cut has a extra bit after the, the elevator door shuts. Mm. It comes to some footage that was uh, unused footage from The Shining of like driving in, in the countryside yeah, yeah, and yeah. trees, okay. uh, in this big lake. And the narration continues as Harrison Ford, or Deckard, I should say, um, and Rachel are in a car, and he's talking about how, oh, she was meant to die, like, two years later, but somehow she lived. Humanity found a way, or something to that effect. And it's this, it's this tacked-on happy ending, letting everyone know I that mean, everything's okay. I, I get why she could survive longer, because it, it was very, like, when, when they're designed with the, you know, the four-year thing, it's clearly implemented into them. It's not, this is just how they are. Hmm. It's a it's a it's a choice that they made to make them have four years because obviously the, otherwise they might revolt. And Rachel was based on Tyrell's niece, so it's like maybe you know maybe he was like okay well, I'll let yeah, but that's not the the problem isn't the logistics of no she's not meant to live past four years that that's you know that's brought up because they wanted to have the happy ending. The problem yeah. is it's this tacked on happy ending that's just there to make everyone feel warm inside. Like yeah, it's kind of stupid, isn't it? There's no ambiguity. There's no like you know possible dark ending yeah that's it's kind of boring because maybe because uh, yeah i think the best part of the end is i mean i think the final shot's a little bit weak because it's just the elevator door shutting it doesn't feel like very climactic but the whole idea that they're running off just in the hope that they can actually live a life because he's found his humanity again like you know they're, yeah. they're going off for humanity <laughs> basically like I, I mean there's i can't like the elevator doors because it's like okay this is closing and they're going to a different level in their lives now like they're going to a different point sure i don't know it's just when it cuts to the credit i just feel like oh okay it, is, I never, yeah. it doesn't feel like a final shot to me. Actually, speaking of weird cuts, there's one that really bothers me in the opening scene uh, when Leon shoots the uh, like the other Blade Runner who's interviewing yeah. him. Uh, the moment he shoots him, it, like you know, the guy like goes through the wall and then it cuts to Leon. And he's already standing up. That that cut has always felt really weird to me. Like it doesn't feel like it flows. You feel like you should see him stand. Yeah, it just feels like it's just. It feels like he's jumped in time. Yeah. No, I see what you're saying. The the assumption is. He stood while we were looking at him going through the wall. It just but feels off. It, just, it does feel weird now that you mention yeah. it. It's, it's always felt off. Every time I, I always forget about it, and then I get to that scene. Uh, you know, I guess I get to that scene. It's the opening scene, but I get to that moment, and I'm like, oh yeah, again. Yeah. No. Now that you mention it, it, does seem strange. I really like the opening, like 10, 15 minutes. I really like the final twenty five thirty. I like any of the Roy stuff in the middle, but the detective stuff and the love stuff. Are really dull <laughs> yeah and it's not that i don't like good slow paced stuff i do but the weird thing with this movie is that it's kind of slow paced without really making dramatic moments out of any of it everything feels very understated it kind of feels slow paced for the sake of being slow paced mm. it doesn't feel like it's justifying it's not doing anything with the pace it's it's not building an atmosphere because we already have an atmosphere it's not you know, punctuating it with any moments because it just goes so long stretches. The only moments that punctuate it are when we cut to other characters. Just it yes. does, just does nothing with it. It's just there. So yeah, Bla Bla Blade Runner is not a perfect movie by any means, uh, and it has a lot of fans, and I get why it has fans, and I, I like it a lot. I say I, I wanted to come into this after my second viewing and and love it a lot more than the first time. I thought, oh, I can I can see the potential to how now that I know what I'm getting, but it never never came off. 
Ridley Scott's a man, when you hand him a, a tight script, he will go away and make a really good movie. Or, at least, at the very least, if you hand him a simple script. Because, I, I, I mean, I've not read the script for the Alien, but that may be a pretty mediocre script. But the reason why it works so well is that it's so simple. Like, there's no... Yeah, it's all about the just the visuals and the visceral yeah. nature of what's going on. Whereas here, you have to deliver. So you give him that, he goes and does a great job. You hand him the script for Gladiator, you hand him the script for... Uh, what else he's done? <laughs> Black Hawk Down, you hand him the script for The Martian he goes away and he'll do a damn solid movie, uh, spectacular even in certain mm. circumstances uh, but if you hand him a weak, weaker script he, he does tend to like, you know like it, the weakness of the script will just show through like, it'll just it'll yeah. be there um, and I think in this case it does have that kind of feeling where it just, it feels could, could have done with another pass through the edit room before the script came, came to shooting yeah, I think maybe another couple of drafts to tighten it and yeah. get the emotion in the right place, make sure it's focusing on the right things. Um, because as it is, uh, it's really solid in the technical side of things. Do you know what? The... It's really funny because I was coming into this conversation bracing myself. I was like, oh, I'm going to have to defend why I didn't love it. Like I, I thought I was really going to have to fight you on this. One. I was expecting oh, no. you to be... I, I, for some reason in my head, you were one of those people who who do love this movie. And I was I was coming in and uh, can I really be bothered to fight tonight? <laughs> Which is yes, I always can. But it was a nice surprise not to have to. Mm. No, no, I I like I love parts of this movie. Yeah, I love no, the I ideas that. of this movie. Um, I just think the final product and big chunks of it are harder to get through than others. Yeah. Um, and it's a shame, but. I still watch it every few years. Like it's still, like it's good enough to revisit, and I, I do, I have enjoyed it more than the first time I watched it. I didn't enjoy it as much this time. Like I say, I, I don't think I was as in the mood as I typically am to just be engrossed by the the visuals and the feel like mm. I'm in the scene and that kind of thing. And definitely, I've picked up the plot better as the more I've watched it because, like I said, there's so many little things that I just kind of like. I'm pretty sure the first time I watched it, I, like I didn't even like. Uh, remember like that uh the origami from most of the movie like all these little moments with the origami were so quick and kind of fleeting they're, they're, they're almost meaningless in yeah. the way they're presented until you get to the end and realize they're important and i feel like yeah like no like really what that should what should have happened with those is that the direction the camera should have made it clear no this is an important little part of his character yeah, this but is... we, we, we were too busy seeing big coca-cola billboards no, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the, the <laughs> what advertising looks like. No, what... no, I am as well. Like it felt very real. Again, it was part of that. You know, this this world feels very real and and accurate. You know, got all these big billboards companies. Like, yeah, that it, it it's it doesn't feel like product placement when it feels like something like this because I get like if there's nothing, I go, I don't believe it. It's just not quite there in the script, and as as a result, um, we have kind of a flawed technical masterpiece. I guess before we get... Well, we'll do ratings first, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about what we expect of the, the new one and maybe hopes and that kind of thing. Um, so, but ratings, what would you rate Blade Runner out of 10? I think a 7.5. Like, I, I, I like it. I think it's very good, but I think there's too many problems for me to say this is a great movie, which is where I get to with an 8. Mm. Yeah. I've rated it in the past. I, I see. I feel bad because after this feud, I'm a little bit more down on it than I usually am. I, I, I think I gave it an eight the first time, but I think some of that was maybe the promise of going, okay, I see where I might like this more next time, so I'll be a bit generous. Yeah, I think I'm going to agree on the seven point five. I think it it just my 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 investment into the characters just isn't quite there enough to really nail the the great factor. Yeah, and I feel like we're really on the low side for this movie, saying that it feels like I'm being really harsh, giving this a 7.5, with its reputation. I can say it's a weird movie. Because like, keep in mind, until the director's cut in, like, 92, I think that was, like, there was a good decade of this being actually kind of a rough movie. Anyway, yeah. just, you know, in, in yeah, a lot yeah. of more obvious ways. And not only was the narration badly written, and it was just repeating like and stating the obvious because it was like, oh, people don't can't follow this movie. We'll ha just have them tell them what's happening in the scene. Yeah, well, that's just insulting. Harrison Ford also really didn't like like it and didn't want to do it, so he sounds bored 
as he's talking. Like he, he's intentionally. It's like I think his plan was to do it so bad in purpose that they would never. Well, they put wouldn't it in. use it. You no, know, I, I don't blame him. He's like, I already, I already did this shit once when I acted the damn thing. Why am I? <laughs> why am I just saying it now? But there you go. A pair of seven point fives from us, which might you know to some people that may be blasphemous, and I kind of get it. But when it comes to going and watching, you know, I mean, it's been a, it's been a, probably like a decade now since I first watched this, but. In terms of like you know when when I had a certain age in you know my early teens where I'm like okay I want to go back and actually see all these classic films and I went back and watched The Godfather and Taxi Driver and uh, the you know the spaghetti westerns with uh, uh, Clint Eastwood and like just you know I mean, that's just some examples but a- anything that was meant to have like a history and like be a part of the cinematic like uh, yeah. lexicon uh, I went back and watched all those movies and I've not seen all of them yet there's, there's always more but it's the point of this show I feel like. Blade Runner is like one of the main ones where I'm like, that didn't quite live up to like my. my no, hopes I get for it. That. I, like, I've had a few of those in the past. I think I've had a few on this show even. Yeah, but, and you're you're crazy for a lot of them, but. No, that's fair, but I mean, most recently, probably something like Fifth Element, where I was a bit more down on it. Well, I wouldn't put that in the same. Caliber. No, no, but in in the sense that I expected to like it more than I did. Okay, sure, but I, like, yeah, I'm talking about like what's another example? Like Chinatown. Maybe I mean it's been a long time since I watched it, and I've only seen it hmm. once. Maybe I'd like it more now, but when I first watched Chinatown, I'm like, eh, I don't get why everyone likes us so much. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fair. That's just how I kind of felt. Uh, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about what we were hoping and what we're expecting from from 2049. Cause, yeah, uh, it's, this is going to be an interesting conversation because, like I said, I've not seen any trailers. I've not really followed much of of what it's about. So, yeah, mm. I don't know what to expect. I'm kind of, I'm kind of blind here. Technically, I think we'll be in for another treat <laughs> because the visuals look great. Mm. Uh, Villeneuve is great, or Villeneuve, what would you say his name? I, w- I would have guessed one of those. No, I'm not going to butcher it as well. I'll leave that to you. Denny V. I'm going to call him Denny V. <laughs> I like it. Um, but yeah, no, so I, th- I think technically it'll, it'll be fine. My my hope is, of course, that it's a better script and I care more about the characters. And that, that is really my, my main hope getting into it. My worry, uh, well, obviously my worry is that it's not a better script, but that's just kind of obvious. Like, uh, you know, I don't have to say that I'm worried it's just not going to be good because obviously I'm worried it's just not going to be good. But my, my other worry is that Ryan Gosling's character is going to feel like just Decker 2.0. No, I get that. Which is strange because I love Gosling. Like, I think he's fantastic. And I'm like, okay, I want to see him in this role. I, I want to see him, you know, in this world. Mm-hmm. But, but he's got to have something different. Yeah, I'm just, I'm hoping there's there's more character to him. And, uh, you know, the trailers don't really give it away one or the other. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit worried as well about um, Jared Lettle's character. He's like the Tyrell character in this. Right, okay. And he's like the birthing the, the 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 replicants who are coming out naked, and like those scenes in the trailer for me are kind of like okay, he's, he's you know it's, it was kind of reminding me of his Joker, where I'm like okay, he's trying to go for this not edgy, edgy is not the right word, but he's doing this ultra stylized character, and he, he right, he's, he's he's really putting putting everything into it because he likes being weird. Okay, yeah, it's it's one of those things where it might seem really strange in a trailer because you're only getting a glimpse mm. of it, but in the full context, it's like okay, maybe this does work. Then, then some, sometimes that, no, I'm not <laughs> defending that one, but we've seen I've seen examples of that in the past. That idea where in a trailer I've gone, eh, it doesn't really look like they're fit in here, but then in the full movie, that hasn't been a problem. Sure, sure, no, that's that's the possibility. But yeah, I, ultimately, I just I really want to really care about the characters, which is something I don't think really happened in this one. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I this is one of those rare times where most of these time you know where we've got a sequel this many mm. years later i'm kind of going okay it's probably not going to live up but maybe i can have a good time this one i'm going and going this could be better this could improve with you know they've they, they could look at that and go okay where are the flaws what can we do better and they can improve this and i can come out of this and say this is a better movie for me i think it's a possibility i think it's a possibility that this could end up being better um one touch i did like this uh, one of the like the the crew or whatever the 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 people doing the effects, uh, the the practical effects I actually put an image, um, in one of the or the, not put an image, but it was in like one of the, the small little featurettes they put on YouTube or whatever, you know, hyping it up. But there was some behind the scenes footage, and they were actually building miniatures for the city. Like it's not just all CG. 
which oh, is actually okay. I appreciate because obviously the miniatures in this all look great. Obviously, oh, we, we mentioned how it was a technical marvel, but we didn't really mention you know, that side of things in terms of effects. We yeah, yeah, the, the miniatures, the visuals, but. yeah, miniatures, the city, all of it looks fantastic. So it's nice that they're doing some of that for the new one. Uh, mm. Very. So, like I say, if nothing else, visually this should be a treat. But um, we'll see. We'll see where else we land on it. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm looking forward to experiencing it and and seeing if I do though like it. Anyway, so that that has been Blade Runner. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments below, uh, and if you do love it, <laughs> that's that's okay. That's cool. If you hate it, that's okay too. But um, I'm just I'm I'm trying to be nice to the people who love it because I'm expecting just a little bit of hate. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we've seen that in the past. But, uh, yeah, so let us know what you think in the comments. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. Get us on Twitter at mailed underscore fudge for channel updates. If you want to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash mailfudgetv. Um, you can do that over there, but otherwise, that is us. So thank you once again for watching. Keep watching movies, and we'll see you next time.